Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is coming back from lunch energized for a discussion of the missteps and delusions and missed opportunities of US and European policy towards Ukraine and Russia. Over the past few decades, we have a great lineup as well as a number of people in the audience that I hope to get to if we have time, so we will jump right into it. I will very briefly introduce the four speakers we have on stage before getting into the discussion. Um, starting with the one closest to me, we have uh, Lesia Vasilenko, so, sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation, uh, a member of the Ukrainian parliament. We then have Radek Sikorsky, uh, a member of the European parliament, former minister of defense and minister of foreign affairs in Poland from 2005 to 2014. Also a former journalist, though Radek, I'm not sure if you uh, like to publicize your, your misspent youth, but worth saying. We have Zanny mitten Beddoes, the editor-in-chief of The Economist, and I just learned, just before this discussion, uh, a former advisor to the Polish Ministry of Finance and also a, an economist at the IMF who worked on uh, issues including Russia in the early 1990s. And then Yegor Cherniaf, um, another member of the, European, of the Ukrainian parliament and also deputy chairman of the Committee on National Security. Uh, thanks to all of you. Um, we will be looking backwards in this panel more than I think we have uh, through most of the discussions in the last two days, uh, not merely for the sake of an academic exercise, but in the hope that that kind of critical examination of the past is essential to helping us getting policy right going forward. Uh, it's certainly core to what we do at Foreign Affairs, so I'm particularly pleased to have the chance to take part in this discussion. I think it's worth saying that while it's uh, hard to deny that Western policy towards this region has failed over the past few decades, there's probably taking place somewhere in the US or Europe today a panel with a very, very similar title, but with a different set of arguments about the past and going forward, one that is focused all on, uh, all on NATO expansion and um, failure to take adequate consideration of uh, Russian security concerns seriously over the past few decades accounts for where we are now. I say that not to uh, uh, stress that, not to agree with that point, but merely to stress to everyone here that there is really deep disagreement in the West about that history, and I think that's part of what accounts for some of the disagreements about policy going forward. So it's worth, worth spending some time on that. There are, of course, several moments over the past uh, 32 years that bear that kind of cr critical examination. We could go back to 1991 or 1994, uh, 2008 or the early years of, of Putin's time in power, but because we have two members of the Ukrainian parliament here who have been part of the, the post-2014 generation of leadership in this country, I want to focus on the last nine years to start this discussion. Um, Lesia, let me, let me start with you. There's an argument embedded in the, the title of this panel about the failures of U.S. and European policymakers. Very briefly, give us your distilled version of what those mistakes were, and most importantly, as you look forward, as you look to policy now and policy debates that you track in the West, what do you think the lessons of that history should be? Uh, well, uh, to start with, we already uh, had our discussion here in preparation for the panel, but actually this discussion started for Radek and myself back in 2017, when it turns out we were uh, together uh, on a similar panel, but entitled then, Should Russia Be Brought Back from the Cold? This was 2017. Uh, the question that Radek asked then was, was Russia ever in the cold? And I very much support that point. Russia was never in the cold. Russia was never in the cold uh, in 2008 when it invaded Georgia. Russia was never in the cold in 2014 when it annexed Crimea and then went on to occupy Donetsk and Luhansk region. And Russia is not in the cold now. If we look at the latest statistics from the Kiev School of Economics, for example, 425 million a day Russia makes from uh, sales of oil. Uh, then if we look at another number, 550 billion is the number that Russian oligarchs are making today. And that's a pre-war number. Uh, this is ridiculous. Russia has been allowed to do this. 
Uh, and who has allowed it? Unfortunately, it's, it's all of us. It's the West largely. The West has still not shifted from Russia comes first. I hear it every time when I take part in uh, media interviews and when I am asked, well, uh, wouldn't asking for this kind of weapon actually provoke Russia? Uh, wouldn't uh, this lead to an escalation, maybe a nuclear escalation? Uh, my answer is always that uh, there is nothing that can provoke Russia. Russia is an empire, it's a colonial power. It decides when to attack and whom to attack. And Russia has done it in the history many, many times. Uh, now, I asked myself, uh, why is this policy of containment still, still present? The economic arguments are there. I try to, to uh, present them in a way. But it's not just about the economy. It's about bad habits, bad habits that really don't want to die. If you, you didn't want to go back into 1991, but we have to go back even further to uh, the Cold War communication strategies, which were all about containment, which from, from both sides of the world, I guess. But then when it was 1991 and the independence of Ukraine, it was also about, oh, uh, whether it will be convenient to recognize, well, not just the independence of Ukraine, whether it will be convenient to recognize the independence of all these states that were once part of the Soviet empire. And uh, really, there was a reluctance around that, and we, we all remember that. And uh, the independence of Ukraine came at a condition, at a condition that would once again be convenient for Russia. Um, Russia comes first strategy actually allowed Russia to slip into the totalitarian regime that the Russian people are living under now. Because if we look at, now back to 2014 and beyond, if we look at 2015, 2015 business was booming with Russia. But uh, Russia pulled out from the European Convention of Human Rights and decided that it will no longer re recognize the European Court of Human Rights decisions as predominant over its national laws. In 2017 was a record year when international companies were investing into Russia. But that was also the year when Russia changed its national legislation and essentially legalized domestic violence. Uh, I'm not going in to go into the statistics over the last 20 years when uh, the free media in Russia were getting shut down on a yearly basis by the dozen. Uh, but today it's worth mentioning that 1,000 political prisoners are rotting away in Russia. Uh, we say in Ukraine sometimes uh, that a good Russian is a dead Russian. It's not about being morbid, it's not about being vengeful, it's the truth. The good Russians of today, they are either dead, killed by Putin's regime, or they are rotting away in the Russian prisons. Very few have managed to escape and it's definitely not the critical mass needed to initiate the regime changes to bring back Russia into a democracy. And I say bring back Russia into a democracy because when there was the breakup of the Soviet Union, sorry, going back to 91 again, there will be a lot of this back and forth here, but uh, all the countries that uh, were once members of the Soviet Union, we were on the same starting mark and we were all about to run the democratic marathon. Some of these countries have already completed this marathon very much successfully. Ukraine is still proudly and resiliently running this marathon, but Russia was out of breath by around 2020. Three times the West saw how Putin was changing the constitution to allow to himself to be the uh, only dictator that whose rule will never end. And this was swallowed by the West again. Russia comes first, economic interests. Uh, today, if you ask me, and I, I see that I have to, to finalize the comments, but uh, I, I would like to end on a practical note. So, so today, what, what, what can we do today? What can the West still do today? Can, the West can do a lot, because uh, if we look at the number of companies that are still present in Russia, since 2022, only 200 or so pulled out. 1,400 something companies still remain, international companies still remain in Russia operating. Philip Morris, PepsiCo, Auchan, uh, Le Roi Merlin, they are, they are making huge amounts of money. At the same time, their excuse, which will never be said publicly, but which is always when they speak honestly with you, is how are we going to explain to the shareholders the investments that we made and that they are getting lost? 
Uh, but again, with the political pressure, with the pressure from the public, some of these companies are pulling out or at least not coming back into the market. I know this for a fact because I myself with a few colleagues here in the room, we participated in the campaign not to allow, not to allow Jameson whiskey back into the Russian market and that was a successful campaign. Uh, so I think that we all can do more. But on a more serious note and something that will be uh, more impactful, I guess that allowing for the use of Russian frozen assets that sit today in central banks and in national banks of various countries is uh, a very definite step that can be taken and must be taken. Canada is the only example today in the world, but it must be a uniform, unified position from across governments because we're talking about 300 billion uh, US dollars of state assets, we're talking about 50 billion of US dollars of oligarchic assets that today sit in banks across the world, in the US, in Switzerland, in the UK, in France, and so on. Uh, so really this reluctance of changing that legislation, it must be shifted the same as must be shifted the reluctance to think about the world without Russia, without Putin. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that very expansive start. It's a, it's a really good note to begin on. But Igor, I wanted to ask you to zero in on one particular aspect of this history, and that's NATO expansion. It used to be when we ran articles at Foreign Affairs on NATO, roughly four people would read them. And now it's probably one of the most popular and most engaging and fraught topics uh, in, in American foreign policy debates, certainly. Um, very famously, there was a debate among American and European policymakers about, about NATO expansion in the 1990s and 2008. Uh, Bill Burns, now the director of the CIA, who was ambassador to Russia under George W. Bush, warned that it was the brightest of all red lines to Russians and not just Putin, who would, as he, he warned, see it as a challenge to their interests. What does that kind of concern, in your view, get wrong about NATO expansion and Ukraine's place in NATO? And as you, you've had conversations with your counterparts in Europe and the United States in, in, in recent months, what do you think they're still getting wrong? Um, well, thank you for the question. Um, it's a little bit narrower than I uh, prepared because, you know, a lot of mistakes was made by Western uh, West, and uh, it's so sweet to speak about mistakes that are not yours. But let's st start from the uh, 2008, maybe. 2008, this is the... Um, the point when was made, I think, the wrong decision for all the security architecture for not only for Ukraine, but for uh, Euro-Atlantic um, sphere. And I think uh, it was the wrong perception in 2008, in 1991, in 1994, during these years, a wrong perception of the West to Russia, because um, unfortunately, in my point of view, uh, West, after the collapse of the USSR, decided that Russia can be democratized, can be a partner, but this is not a true. If you look on the history of Russia, Russian Empire, Soviet Union, um, its empire, its a tyranny, it's autocratic um, state which cannot live as a democracy because of plenty of nations inside, because of plenty of religions inside. This is only one way how to be as a one state, to be autocracy. Another thing that I think um, was wrong from the perception of the West that Russia can be a reliable partner. Russia never consider West as a partner, as a competitor, as an enemy, as an um, object, as a market, yes, maybe, but not as a partner. And this wrong perception that you can sit on the table and agree something, and this, what you sign just, will be uh, fulfilled by Russia, um, it's not about Russia, and we have to understand it. We understand it as Ukrainians, we understand it, because we have 
not the same mindset, but we understand the man's mindset of, of Russians, of Kremlin, of Putin. Um, another thing that I think we have to know, that Russia can and acts not rationally, but emotionally, if you want. And when you, I mean you, the West, think that um, it will be too, um, I don't know, too important or too uh, hard to them if you broke the benefit connections or economic connections with Russia. Uh, it's not, because for them, the building of the empire is much important than just have some benefits from, from the West. That's why they will continue this war. Not because of um, just some territories of Ukraine, because their uh, main goal is um, revising of the world order, revising of the um, security architecture. Um, and actually, the next thing about the cooperation or co even colluding just with this territory, because uh, I don't see the perspective of cooperation with Russia, uh, the West with Russia in, in the future. Uh, because not even only, um, not even, not on the economic level, not on political level, because it's a paradox, but uh, during the last 30 years, um, we, the West, Ukraine, feed Russia giving the benefits, economic benefits, and uh, buying the oil and other things, and we feed the enemy, we feed the um, army, which right now started this horrible war. We have to revise the perception of Russian Federation. We have to revive the um, approach how to, how to work with them. Um, another thing that I think um, we are on, that during this, this, these decades, that we can split Russia and China. We can, because I heard a lot before even 2022, that we cannot push on, on, on Russia because we um, probably push out in, in the arms of China, Russia. We don't want their collaboration, but this is the true, that they have the same goals. They won't dominate in Euro, um, Eurasia. They want to revise the uh, world order. They have the same goal, the same way, and um, Russia will never refuse the um, connection with China. It's a myth. And to NATO and our membership. So understanding all of this, maybe the leadership of the U.S., the leadership of Ger Germany made the decision in favor of Putin that we don't want to, um, uh, to make bad our, con our connection with Russia. Okay, if you want that Ukraine will not um, receive the map, let's, let's uh, um, postpone it for the future. But the truth is that this decision led to this war. Because if Ukraine was a member of NATO, of course, Russia will never cross the border of NATO. Um, we have to understand that if we want to prevent the next wars in the future, there shouldn't be any gray zones between two words, authoritarian and democratic. Ukraine should be a member of NATO. And this is only one way how we can provide sustainable peace in the Euro-Atlantic region. Um, and actually, right now, this is, I think, the win-win situation for NATO and for Ukraine. Because we have experienced people, we have a lot of weapons right now, and uh, we can provide, we can be became a shield for Europe, for um, all Euro-Atlantic sphere. So I think 
these lessons should be learned and this mistake shouldn't be repeat. Thank you. C can I just make sure I understand your point about democracy in Russia? Your view is there can be democracies if Russia splits up, but there can be no democracy in Russia as we, it's now constituted. Um, Radek, let, let me go to you. You spent uh, your, your years in government making the case to your American and, and European counterparts, especially Western European counterparts, that uh, the West needed a different kind of approach to, to Russia and to Ukraine. Uh, you're a very persuasive guy, but you did not succeed in, in persuading all or even a majority of them through those years. Why not? What, what, what happened in those arguments that you think um, prevented people from um, seeing what was coming? And then most importantly, what are we still missing? You wrote a piece in, in Foreign Affairs just a few months ago about all the ways in which Europe is still not stepping up despite all that it's done. As our, uh, the German member of the previous panel noted, it'd be hard to imagine uh, many Western European countries doing everything they're doing now if we'd uh, had this discussion two years ago, but you still see us as falling short. So where, uh, where do we need to be doing more um, as you look forward? I'll answer your question, but let me just make two brief comments to what's been said before. Um, I was at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008. By the way, uh, so was Putin. Let's remember, he was a member of the Afghan coalition. And as George Bush told us uh, last night, it really was Angela Merkel who stopped uh, Ukraine getting the membership action plan. I suspect that, and more than suspect, that Putin had told her, if you give map to uh, Ukraine and Georgia, I will do Ukraine and Georgia. And let's now focus on what happened. We didn't give them map or membership. We actually did nothing to bring them closer to NATO. And he still did Georgia and Ukraine, which I think um, demolishes the argument about uh, this being about Russian security. Um, which I think, by the way, I have a, a killer uh, argument that comes from the old days. Um, there was a joke we told one another in Poland. What is a secure border of the Soviet Union? A secure border of the Soviet Union is a border that has Soviet soldiers on both sides of it. Okay? And if you define Russian security in that way, then you may as well give up and uh, capitulate. So we, we can't accept that. Uh, I agree with everything Alessia said, except the point on investments. I've always encouraged companies to invest in Russia on the grounds that only when they lose their own money will they ever learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> and ask BP or, or Siemens or any number of them. I still encourage them to go to China. <laughs> Maybe they'll discover eventually that if you have no rule of law, eventually your investments <laughs> are in trouble. Huh? Um, <clears throat> but on dealing with Russia, I have a slightly different view. Um, because I don't see how you can conduct foreign policy on the grounds that a country is inevitably always going to make the wrong choices. I believe you always have to give your partners what Americans called an off-ramp to the, the opportunity to make the right choice. And of course, it's very difficult for Russia. You know, we've discovered in the last few years that in our own societies, the proportion of population devoted to our rule of law, liberal values, and so on, is less than we thought. And in Russia, it's even lower, you know, 15, 20%. They've also been very unlucky, you know, just as they started reforming themselves at the beginning of the 20th century, you had World War I. You know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Yeltsin unfortunately passed the baton onto Putin and rather than Nemtsov. But I can imagine alternative uh, pasts. And I have to say that Putin, for a while, did invest some political capital in wanting um, to have a different course for Russia. You know, when you read his manifesto as prime minister, there was a plan for real modernization there. Uh, Putin is the first leader of Russia who came to Katyn, the place of the massacre of Polish officers. That was you know, a success of Polish diplomacy. 
Uh, now, coming to the West, because that's your question, I think the fundamental reason is that the sense of insecurity in Europe is uneven. I don't have to tell you about us, but I suspect that if you're a Belgian, a Portuguese, or Italian, you know that your country has never had Russian soldiers against uh, your will, and never will. And that colors perceptions. You know, we are the West's tank mine. Okay? So number one. But number two, I think the grown-ups in Western Europe understand the nature of the beast, understand the nature of Putinism. You know, my, my, um, my quarrels with uh, West European colleagues were not about uh, whether Putin murders people. They all knew he did. It, it was about what to do about it. And it was a kind of uh, debate of paradigms. Are we in the 1930s? And are we passing by an opportunity to stop a dictator before it's too late? Or are we in 1914? And by overreaction, perhaps causing a war we don't want? And of course, uh, you know, my argument, unfortunately, uh, has proven correct. But my quarrel with Western Europeans was not to try to um, Europeanize or, no or normalize relations uh, with Russia. You know, they think of Putin not as a potential Democrat, rather as a hijacker with a suicide vest who might um, uh, blow up himself, his victim, and half the village. And you know, how do you stop him? That's the real deep thinking, I think. My real quarrel was that West, some Western countries uh, did not have a plan B in case plan A fails. So plan A, let's try to normalize Russia, let's give it a chance. And Poland had a plan B in the form of solid 2% of GDP on defense year in, year out for 15 years. And some others didn't, and now we're paying the price. Can I, Rada, can I get you to um, talk a bit about U.S. policy? U.S. policy has also shifted quite dramatically in the last couple of years. Is it where it needs to be? Where do you have disagreements with, um, with U.S. policymakers as you interact with them? Look, if you'd asked me two years ago what would happen when Putin invades, and by the way, I knew he was going to invade when I read that essay uh, he wrote, uh, I would now tell you... Um, Europe has overperformed, the US has overperformed, Ukraine has massively overperformed, and the Russian army and Russia has underperformed massively. So, sure, I can have some disagreements about the, the, the schedules of delivery and the types of weapons, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, we, sh we should do more. But the most catastrophic mistakes have been done by Putin. He's a classic gambler who was very skillful in taking advantage of our mistakes in Syria, during the Arab Spring, in various other places, and he's run out of luck, as they always do. Zani, I want to get you to address one point in history that has come up and then, and then to look forward. The historical question, you were working in the IMF, you were working in Poland in the early years after the fall of communism, there was a theory in much of the West that economic reform, trade, you know, all, all of the, the context that would come along with it would be part of transforming Russia. We had a similar theory with China and that's um, uh, similarly come to a, a disappointed end. Was the problem there execution or theory? Was there any, any chance that could have worked if we'd uh, tweaked our approach, or was that always doomed to fail? I think the short answer to that is that it was largely execution. Um, I'm somewhat closer to Radek that I don't think this was all inevitable, but I, I want to go back with a little bit of history in that it seems to me Europe, and you almost need to go back before 91 to the 70s, the, the key to the sort of economic relationship within the Soviet Union was Germany. And Germany, you know, very early on decided that it was going to have as a key part of its industrial base cheap energy, cheap gas from Russia. And they were warned in the 70s by the Americans of relying too much on the Soviet Union. 
but it became an absolutely key part of kind of core German thinking. And as we progressed through the decades, it became increasingly, you know, cheap gas from Russia, security from the US, and then over the past couple of decades, a market in China. All three of those, frankly, are remarkably risky things for a country to rely on. Uh, Germany didn't learn that until 18 months ago. And after 2014, Germany absolutely didn't get that. Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, there was still, in German industry, this sense that it was an important part of German competitiveness that it had cheap energy, cheap gas from Russia. There are other countries in Europe obviously, where the reliance was even greater, but because of Germany's importance, it's completely central. That's part of what drove Merkel. It's also, you know, her, her whole political approach was not to be radical. It was to be very, very cautious. But underneath it was a very clear mercantilist desire to kind of keep underpinning the German economy. I think that has actually fundamentally changed, and that's why I slightly have a different perspective, I guess, to some of my colleagues. I do think that Russia, as far as many countries in Europe is concerned, is now out in the cold. And that there has been a fundamental economic shift. The Titan vendor, the determination to have a clean break in Germany is real. They haven't implemented it enough yet, but if you see a country that, frankly, you know, can't do anything very fast, create six LNG terminals in a matter of months. It is determinedly changing where its energy has come from. It's accelerating the green transition. There is no way Germany is going back to the kind of reliance on gas from Russia that it had before. So that is a real change. There isn't the same change in every country. Austria has barely changed at all. Italy hasn't changed that much. But Germany is the most important in that. But Russia is a supplier, a producer of commodities, and commodities are sold on global markets. Gas was slightly different because it had to go through pipelines, but even there you can turn it into LNG, and over time it will become more of a global commodity. And I think the important thing to think about when you think about can the West put Russia in the cold economically, I think we've learned in the last two years that it's really, really hard. Because Russia's strength is that it supplies commodities that are needed around the world. And so I actually am surprised at the number of sanction packages the Europeans had. I think it's too simple to say they should do more. They're not going to be terribly effective because what Russia does is sell commodities that the world wants. And actually, much of the world isn't playing this game. You know, Russia is an active member of the BRICS. The only reason Vladimir Putin wasn't in South Africa for the BRICS meeting is that he was worried about being arrested because of the ICC warrant. But the next BRICS meeting next year is in Kazan. It's in Russia, and they all agreed to it, and all the expanded new BRICS members are going to troop to Russia. They don't buy this narrative that we need to have sanctions on Russia. And if they don't buy this narrative, it's not going to happen. And so economically, the idea that you can simply cut off Russia isn't going to happen because the West can't do it by itself. What the West can do is inflict damage and has inflicted damage because Russia, you know, the late Senator John McCain said, I think it was more than a decade ago, Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. It's now a gas station to India and China and a few other places, and it's not ever going to be anything else because what the sanctions do do is prevent the upgrading of the most productive areas of the Russian economy, and, and that has been hit hard. But the point of going into all of this is that I think if I've learned over the last two years, and, and we've supported all of these sanctions, I don't think that is a route to a really big part of the Ukrainian victory. I actually think much, much more important is obviously Ukrainian bravery and Ukrainian capability, but it is weapons, it is military support, and it is the economic perspective of membership in the European Union. That's what turned around Poland, where I worked, as you said, in 1992. It was the prospect of EU membership. It was looking west. So it's not, it's not cutting off Russia that is going to be important economically. It is going to be the support and the perspective of being in the west. Can I get you to, um, to, to reflect on this question of Russia being in the cold when it comes to the security dimensions? I think in the US, certainly, it's hard for many people to imagine Russia becoming uh, you know, a version of North Korea, but much larger and with, with a much more serious nuclear arsenal. That there still is some sense that we will need to imagine some kind of security relationship with Russia in the long term. Do you see 
that changing? Do you see that as a kind of a, a, a fact of debate in Western Europe and the US that won't change? Radek would love your quick thoughts on this as well, Dr. Zanny. I think there is a different perspective on both sides of the Atlantic. I, I think across the board, everyone is understandably and rightly focused on Ukrainian victory, that no one has really thought too hard about what the relationship is with a Russia after that. We don't quite know what the Russia is going to be like. We don't know if it's going to be one country. We, we, however we define Ukrainian victory, there is going to be a landmass with people in it. There are going to be nuclear weapons there. It will have some capability. I think there's more thinking of that in the US and more concern about that in the US because the US is obviously focused particularly on China, and they prospect of a sort of allyship of autocracies that includes Russia, North Korea, Iran, and China is not a particularly appealing one. So I think there is more thinking in the US. I think in Europe, the focus is much more on European, the, the Europeans talk a lot about this, you know, European strategic autonomy. I think there is now increasingly active thinking about it. And that's where Ukraine is an absolutely essential part. I mean, if Europe is going to take greater responsibility for its own security in future, and frankly, I think it has to, because if you think years ahead, I think the US is shifting its focus. Doesn't mean the US is abandoning it, but it's shifting its focus. So Europe needs to think more, needs to build up its military capability, needs to build up its military production. Ukraine is a central player in that. Ukraine is absolutely central part of European defense. And so, yes, I do think the thinking is shifting on both sides of the Atlantic, but probably not fast enough, frankly, because I don't think there's been enough sort of shaping of what that looks like on either side. Radek? I don't think you can have a different relationship with Putin, because when the head of state lies blatantly and blatantly breaks international treaty, how can you trust his word or his signature? You know, people who say that, uh, uh, that there should be a deal. <laughs> Russia and Ukraine already have a deal. They have a treaty of friendship with, a, with, a, with border guarantees. So we would have to say, oh, he, well, he, he broke that treaty, but the next one, don't worry, he, he will honor, that's absurd. So um, yes, we should be thinking about what kind of relationship we can have with a post-Putin Russia. And when you look at the history of colonial wars, uh, such as this one, they are only ended by a different team than started them, whether you look at France or Britain or Portugal. Uh, um, and I think this will happen here too. And then I hope the new Russian leadership um, uh, will take a fresh look. My friend and mentor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, used to say that um, Russia has a choice of either being an ally of the West or a vassal of China. And I think a part of Russian elite must be worried about the wrong choice that Putin has made. And you know that when that becomes a dominant view, then we'll have a subject for a conversation. Igor, I saw you shaking your head. So yeah, <laughs> because you still believe that in uh, Russia can be some democratic regime. No, I didn't say that. Well, after the Putin, after the Putin's regime, will came somebody like, I don't know, Navalny or other one, but he will be in the same circumstances where you have a lot of nations, a lot of religions that you, and actually request for the power, for the powerful <laughs> power, if you want. So it's a, it's a mindset of, of, of Russians, imperial, um, autocratic mindset. I don't believe that after. So the, I, I shake in my head when uh, you saw uh, you said about the, uh, that Putin had the choice between became a partner of West or vassal of China. He never considered uh, Europe or the West as a partner, as a competitor, as an enemy, as a market, but not a partner. Never. I think it's great to disagree among friends. So I'll take this, uh, taking a risk, uh, uh, taking a risk as a as a friend of Ukraine. I don't get your negative attitude towards Navalny. This is a man who's been poisoned by Putin. No, 
This is a man who is in Putin's prison in solitary confinement, and yet this is a man who, taking a risk with his own population, issued a manifesto saying that if he has anything to do with it, he will withdraw Russian forces from every inch of Ukrainian territory and pay Ukraine reparations from future revenues. I'm telling you, you will not get a, get a better deal from any other Russian politician ever. Why don't you take it? Lassia, let me go to you. Can I, can I take that? Let's, let's let Lassia jump is in. Not it, is, it is, I don't, I, I'm not a spokesman for Navalny, but there are patriotic Russians who have concluded that empire has been bad for Russia. Encourage them. Radek, Radek, you uh, are absolutely... We are talking right. about the good Russians, so-called good Russians. But, you know, I, um, it doesn't matter what surname you have. I, I said about the circumstances, about the request, about Chechnya, about Tatarstan, about other nations that had to be under the power, but not democracy. And if you are a president of Russia, you should be so so-called Putin or not Putin, collective Putin, if you know, if you, if you want. I'm talking about this. This is the request. This is the history of, of Russia during the centuries. This is the request for, imp for empire. It doesn't matter. It will be Navalny or other, other person who will be in charge of, of, of Russia. Let, let's, let's go to Lassia and then we'll... Continue the conversation. Uh, maybe I will try to find peace between the two of you. Uh, Radek, you are right. Uh, there are uh, Russians who admit the wrongs that have been done by Putin's regimes. Moreover, that admit the wrongs that have been done uh, by, by the Soviet Empire. But how many of them are there? One Navalny is not enough. Of course. 1,000 of those political prisoners are not enough. Russia is a population of how many? 150, 140 million, nobody knows because we don't trust their statistics as we don't trust any information coming out of that country. But in any case, we need at least 100 million Navalny's for there to really be the changes and for Ukraine to be able to take any kinds of deals. But before we come to deals, this is way, way too early to talk about that. Uh, before that, the world needs to be brave enough, brave like Ukraine, to imagine what it will be like for Russia to lose not just Ukraine's victory, but Russia's loss. What does that look like? The world needs to be brave enough to accept that there must be a tribunal, and it must not be just a dozen countries here and there, it must be a uniform effort. I'm looking at Michael here because the, uh, the McFall Yermak group is working on the sanctions. Uh, these sanctions must continue until Russia pays out the reparations for all the damage and the harm caused, and the world must be brave enough again to push for these reparations to be paid out by Russia. Zaini, you said about uh, that, you know, th there's still going to be land with people and there's going to be nuclear. Is there going to be nuclear? Again, the world needs to be brave enough to introduce the sanctions and go as far as to take away the nuclear, uh, as to take away maybe some of the ports, maybe take away some of the things as a part of the reparations and the sanctions for the act of aggression. The act of aggression, was, which today is the gravest international crime which one country is committing against another country, and at that is committing against the rest of the world, and at that for which uh, the taxpayers of the West are paying. By the way, they don't have to be paying for that because uh, at least part of the cost could be covered by uh, the, the frozen assets which sit in the central banks. Uh, but again, that's another thing. But in order for all of that to happen, the world needs to recognize that until Russia stays the way it is under Putin, uh, business as usual will be too expensive, as Radek has said, and uh, th there will always be this threat to long-term peace and security. But uh, to recognize that and to take action on that, there needs to be some bravery, brave like Ukraine. And what we need from our Western partners is the slogan, the motto of uh, the Yes February event that was held here in commemoration, stay in the fight. Zania, do you want to react quickly to that? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to react to that. Uh, I think you are, there is a danger in conflating the world and the West. You say the world must do this, the world must do that, our Western partners must force this. 
If only, frankly, it were so easy. The West has tried. The West is not able, has not convinced a large chunk of the world to go along with the sanctions that are in place now, never mind any new sanctions. And while I wish it were different, I think rather than exhorting the West to do more, it is better to say, this is the world as it is. We have a group of countries, the BRICS in particular, that have immediate economic reasons for not doing this. India is a very good example. Fareed mentioned it yesterday. India is in many ways incredibly important to the US. The US is desperately building a relationship with India. India is getting a huge amount of cheap energy products from, from Russia, way more than it got two years ago. And it is not changing that. And it would be strategically, frankly, mad for the US to push the Indians to do more because there are all kinds of other areas that they, A, the Indians wouldn't do it, I don't think, but B, because there are other broader considerations. So I think rather than wishing this area of economics was different, the West is actually not a large, I mean, it's, no, it's, not, it's not a big enough player by itself to make these changes, particularly for a country that is a commodity exporter. And so I think we need to focus on what's possible and what's possible is much more focused, as I said, on the military, on the assistance, on the kind of bringing to Europe, rather than kind of chaotic attempts through sanctions that frankly I think have you know, relatively little effect and will have even less effect because even the oil market is fundamentally changed. The shadow oil market has completely changed. There's huge amounts of oil coming, which is actually Russian oil, coming through various shadow things into Europe, despite the best intentions of the sanctions. So it's not, I, I don't wish it was like this, but, but the, the economic, a globalized world, it's just very, very hard to cut a commodity exporter off, particularly if not everybody else is playing ball. And I think we should just recognize that, stop focusing on it so much, and focus on things where there really is leverage. Let me give you 30 seconds. So, to so yes, uh, I agree that we need to focus on the global south more. And we started talking about the lessons for the West, but there's actually a very important lesson for Ukraine. Our lesson is that we have uh, ignored the countries which fall uh, outside of the Western Hemisphere. We have uh, ignored uh, African countries, Latin American, uh, for, for, okay, we can find many reasons for that, but that's a fact. And uh, our lesson is that we need to start working with them and building up the dialogues, and that's what we are doing. Uh, the remedies which uh, myself and Igor have tried to, to put forward, and also uh, you as our co-panelists, uh, they won't uh, give the solutions and the results overnight. Let's be frank about that. But but this is the line that in which we can start thinking, debating, discussing, and this is something that I guess I wish the world will be ready for. Radek, 30 seconds, and I want Just to go to Just one sentence. Comments. It is beyond Western power to deprive Russia of her nuclear weapons. We, it cannot be done. L let me, let me get, there's a, there are many people in the audience who should be part of this conversation. Let me go to a small sample of them to react to some of what we've heard so far. I wanna start with uh, the two, two American ambassadors in the audience, uh, Mike McFall and John Erbst. Um, Mike, let me start with you. I won't accuse you of being a diplomat, but you have been involved for much of your life in efforts to promote a different kind of Russia. Uh, we have not seen those come to fruition yet, but give some, some reflection on that experience as well as uh, to what we've heard so far. Well, I have... Uh 18 points that I want to make. How much time do I get? You can, you can have half a point. All right. So just two things I would say on the history, um, and then I want to say something very concrete about this sanctions debate, because I disagree with you. I want to make sure friends can disagree, right? Uh, the mistake we made in one sentence was not, you're right, we made a, we made a bet in the 90s. I, I lived in Russia in the 90s. I was there, part of the National Democratic Institute. Our job was to promote democracy in Moscow. That's, I was there. That was a bet. What is the result? We failed. <laughs> but, 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 but hold on, hold on. We failed because of things that we did not control. And, and I want to say two things. The mistake we made was that while we were experimenting with that, we didn't have the plan B. I agree 100% with Roderick. We didn't do the plan B in the same time. Some historical data. 1996, we didn't talk about NATO expansion until the day after Boris Yeltsin was reelected, because we were so worried about the things that you're talking about with Bill Burns. That was a mistake. We should have moved forward with everything across Europe with weapons. 
with NATO expansion, and to hell with whether the Russians cared about it or not. It was the mistake to think, oh my goodness, we're going to offend this guy and that guy and Putin. That was the mistake. We should have done both because when we failed, and we failed, we would have already done all that other stuff. Roddick said it more eloquently than me. That is the long-term history. But the second thing I want to say about the history is when you say Russia and Russians believe this and Russia is that, that's exactly what Vladimir Putin wants the world to think. He wants everybody to think that all Russians are the same, uh, that there's no difference, and that history will never change. And I don't know if the Russian empire will collapse. They most certainly did not. They failed at that, right? The empire is there, and I don't want to predict that I know. But to assume that it's going to be there forever is an assumption that I, I think is a hypothesis, not an assumption. And remember, when Putin says we're all the same, he wants you to forget Boris Nemtsov, because Russians are all the same, right? He, he wants you to forget Volodya Karamazov, because all Russians are the same. So be careful when you say, you're right, it's two, three, four, and we can talk all night about Navalny, but, but, but it's not zero, because when you say it's zero, that's exactly what Putin wants the world to believe. The last thing I want to say, if I can, I, a, in terms of what is the lesson now, and, and I've actually written this in your, your journal several times many years ago. I just looked up something I published with you in 1995, Fareed, uh, in, our, in terms of our mistakes. Right now, it's containment. There's no, there's no dealing with Putin. There's no way. And I disagree that we, we can only do so much. No. Remember, the sanctions on, on oil and gas is not to have the Indians not buy oil. It's to have them buy it at a discounted price so that Putin does not have money to continue his war. That's what the price cap is about. It's at $60 now. I think it should be at $30. But we're not arguing that they're not going to do that. We just don't want them to make money off of it. But the second thing, to your point, we can do a lot more without the Indians, without the South Africans, without the Chinese. You mentioned it. Pepsi's there. What the hell? Our chips from my country have been going to Russia to build weapons that are killing Ukrainians now. It's not the Indians. It's not the others. These are fake companies in Hong Kong. It's Western technology that is doing that. And COCOM, if you remember that from the Soviet days, in the old Soviet days, we, did, we had a regime, a multilateral regime to stop this. If there's one thing we should do, all the other things, I could go through other sanctions, but one thing, we can't allow Western technology to go to Russia to build missiles that kill Ukrainians. So to focus on that one thing, that would be a great achievement. We can do it without the global south, without the, the I don't know, we can't use that phrase anymore. Without India, without South Africa, even without the Chinese, that's one thing we should do, and that's a lesson we should learn from the okay. previous period. Let me go to uh, John Erbst. <laughs> Radix right yes. that there have been important changes in Western policy since Russia's big invasion. Uh, but the problem is there's a change in attitude which has not been fully realized as a change in policy. And old instincts remain, whether it's the slow sending of weapons from all, all Western nations to Ukraine, the more advanced weapons needed to end this fight quickly, and the refusal on the part of the West as a whole, except for the Eastern European nations whose very existence depend upon intelligent geostrategic thinking to outline the problem. The problem is simply a revisionist Russia and also a revisionist China that needs to be stopped. So Michael's right that the policy of the moment is containment. It needs to be a far more vigorous containment than we see right now. It involves, again, pointing out, especially to American voters, that if we don't send roughly $45 billion of military and economic assistance to Ukraine, yearly American soldiers may be dying in the Baltic states or elsewhere in Eastern Europe when Putin decides that he can provoke us and get away with it with a NATO country. Those stakes have not been clearly laid out. Were they laid out that way, the current strongish American public support for this war would be much greater. 
And that would be reflected across the West. One more point. Something which continues to hamper Western policy because it hampers American policy is an unseemly for a superpower fear of nuclear bluster. We've had 70 years of nuclear politics, right? The Soviet Union got the bomb actually over 70 years ago. We had 70 years in which there have been crises, sometimes very dangerous crises, over Berlin in 61, Cuba in 62. And I, I challenge the historians in this room to go back and find one statement by a senior American official during those crises saying, hey, we can't do X because Putin might go, excuse me, uh, Khrushchev, who did threaten us with nukes, would go nuclear on us. Not once. That's not to say we don't take into serious account the possibility of nuclear escalation. But you are sending a signal of weakness to your foe when you talk about this. Last point on this. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to the quasi-isolationists in the United States who, thank God, remain uh, ineffectual. Uh, remain. Doesn't mean they always will be ineffectual. Talking point number one for them, if it isn't about the border, which is an entirely separate issue, it's we are risking nuclear war. They have been given this argument by the White House. It's, of course, ridiculous that the guys who want to make America great again are quivering in their boots over Putin's nuclear threats. But irony is part of politics. Thank you. Thanks, John. Let's go to Alex Sobel. That, thank you. Uh, I think that one of the lessons is we build our mistakes a long way back. They don't happen today for tomorrow. Um, and that's been really obvious from this discussion. I agree um, with Michael and with John about containment, but we have to think about the future challenge, and, and having a strategy containment isn't enough. So, Lesia talked about the Global South. There's a real problem here. The West have promised the Global South a lot, $100 billion in climate finance, which has not been delivered. Uh, overseas development aid, which has not been delivered. Infrastructure, which has not been delivered. We are building problems for tomorrow in the Global South. The West needs to be delivering that now, because that will aid not just Ukraine, but the whole of um, the, the former Soviet uh, states that are democratizing, and that whole, our whole geogra geogra geography at the edge of the West. Um, because without the Global South, we won't be able to progress. And Ukraine has a unique role in that, because un Ukraine feeds the Global South. And we need to lie with Ukraine on this as a strategy going forward. Thank you. And with apologies to everyone else in the room who has uh, uh, something to say in this conversation, let me go to Fareed Zakaria for the closing word. I would just make <clears throat> two points, uh, one small and one large. Uh, First of all, a fascinating conversation, and I, I learned an enormous amount. The first is to underscore the point that Zanny and then, and then Mike McFall made. We are not trying to get people not to buy Russian oil. It's very important to understand that. If you were to try to ban Russian oil, oil prices would go to $200, gas in America would triple in price, and American support for Ukraine would plummet. The easiest way to destroy American support for Ukraine would be to have people stop buying Putin's oil. This is the uncomfortable reality that Zani was talking about, which is given that they export this vital commodity to the world, you, you don't have a way around it. And therefore, my conclusion is the same she came to. There is only a path on, uh, uh, to victory here on the battlefield. And that is why it needs to be faster, stronger. The aid needs to, the military aid needs to be much greater. The attackums need to come much faster because you can change his dynamic, his, his calculation. If, if he is losing soldiers on the battlefield, waiting for him to run out of, of, of oil money, it's going to be a long wait. The second point I'd make is just the history of it, just to remind us all, it was not such a foolish idea to think about a, a different relationship with a different Russia. Boris Yeltsin's Russia was a different Russia. It did give Ukraine independence. It did try to establish a different relationship with the West. It did not vociferously object to NATO expansion. 
that was a Russia that might have gone in a different direction. And, you know, who knows? The, the what ifs of history are great. Do people remember that uh, Vladimir Putin did not appoint, uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin did not appoint Vladimir Putin as his successor right at the start? He appointed Gaidar, and then Gaidar uh, uh, resigned. Then he appointed Viktor Chernomyrdin. Then Chernomyrdin resigns. He appoints Primakov. Primakov resigns. I'm going back into deep Soviet history here. We then appoint, he then appoints Kirienko. Kirienko resigns because of the de default on the debt. Then he appoints Sergei Stepashin. Then he appoints boy, uh, Vladimir Putin. Who knows if one of these guys had, uh, had you know, I mean, Chernomyrdin. First of all, he would have died five years later. We know that for a fact. And that might have allowed for some transition of leadership. But we do have to think about Maybe it's a hope, but we do have to imagine a Russia that can come to terms with modernity, can come to terms with its empire, can come to terms with the modern world. Because if we don't, we're in for a very, very tough, long, many, many decades in the 21st century. We've been kindly given a couple extra minutes from the organizers, so let's go to a final comment from, from Manuel Valls, who is in the audience somewhere. There he is. Sure. Carl uh, Bilt, your hand was up so we can give you the closing word. Yeah. Here. And I was going to give you, I was going to give you a piece of good news, so while I'm comfortable with the question. The, um, the uh, community from the G20 in India is quite interesting. Listen to this language. In line with the UN Charter, all states must refrain from the threat or the use of force to seek territorial acquisition against the territorial integrity and sovereignty or political independence of any state. That's quite something. So what has happened is most probably that the Chinese have accepted this language because the Chinese talk about territorial integrity for reasons that are fairly obvious. And then Russia and everyone else, and then Russia couldn't stand alone, a bad day for the Kremlin in Delhi, I would say. So that's the good news. Then just an uncomfortable question. Since reality is quite complicated sometimes, why does Ukraine still earn a substantial number of billions every year by transiting gas? We will end on that note. Please thank our panelists for a rich and lively discussion. We could go on, but we have to stop. <laughs>